on. Now I'm on. There we go. So it's been a good weekend so far. Okay, I take that as a no because most of you were silent. I'm going to turn my phone off because if I don't, it's going to look like the uh, guys in the back aren't doing their job right. So we'll do that. So have you ever thought about your vacation, really thought about your vacation? And Jeanette and I went on vacation a little while ago, and typically when we go on vacation, depending on what we're doing, sometimes we will drive and sometimes we fly. And this last time we went on vacation, we drove because we were going to go camping. And the last I heard, they don't allow planes in campsites. So we decided that we were going to drive, and when you drive 900 miles with a six-year-old, it's always an adventure. I, in today's society and in technology the way it is, it's not nearly as bad as it was when I was growing up. Because when I was growing up, they didn't have... TVs mounted to the, to the roof of your car. They didn't have cell phones and iPads that you could download movies and music and whatever else you wanted to. They didn't have things like that. So when, I went, when we went on vacation and I was young, as a, as a kid, you had three options. And really, these were the only options you had. Okay, I'll throw a fourth one in there just for the fun of it. One is read a book. Who could say, I can do that? Some of you can. My wife, she starts books, and then she finished sleeping. That's how it looks like. Two is you could color. Take crayons and a coloring book and color. Three, look out the window and watch everything pass by. And the fourth one that I decided to throw in there at the last minute was talk to your family. Oh, God forbid that happened while you're on vacation. When you go on vacation, most of you do not think it is going to be a wonderful trip and I can't wait to travel and spend five hours in an airplane. Or in our case, 16 hours on the road. Yes, driving from Utah here, uh, we spent about 16 hours on the road. Uh, I don't, it's, not for the, it's not for the faint of heart. The only good thing about traveling from here to Utah was that most of it was spent in Nebraska. You're going to go, what? There's something good about Nebraska? Yeah, because there was hardly anybody else on the road. You just hop by, you set the cruise control, and you just go, and there's not a lot of people there. One of the things that we don't, when, when we're thinking about vacation, one of the things we don't think is joy in the journey. I do, and here's why. Because I plan stops so I can play golf. Nobody else does that? Anybody else do that? Anybody? Okay, we got a couple people, actually. When we drove over there, we were going to stay the night, and we stood the night in, in Wyoming. And I got up early in the morning, and I went and played golf, and we were on the road by about 1030 in the morning. And that got us to, to her parents' place uh, enough to, in time to eat dinner. I, 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 I look for opportunities to play golf, and in so, I think about traveling and how we're going to travel. I find... Joy in the journey. And a lot of times when we, are, when we are planning things, we don't necessarily think about joy in the journey. What do we think about? Getting there. When somebody asks you, how was your vacation? Do you go through and spend two hours talking about the journey to your destination and back? No. Unless you stop and play golf. 
then you do tell them. You think about the destination and what the destination, what you're going to do, how much fun you're going to have. That's what you think about when you, you don't think necessarily about the journey, although you might plan some things. Unless your, des- unless your vacation consists of traveling to six different places and spending time in the car every day, you don't think about how the, the, the journey, you think about what you're going to do in vacation. And when you have a goal, when you have a, an idea of something that's going to be great, you suffer through the journey, don't you? You just say, I know we, we went to uh, Florida last summer. We flew down to Florida. Um, we were at general council, and then we just sped over to, uh, where did we go? Fort Myer. And we stayed at Fort Moir for a week. You know what? I suffered through the plane ride. Why? Because I was looking forward to that vacation. I wasn't looking forward to sitting to some, some guy who snores on the plane. So I don't think I had to do that. I've been pretty lucky. Most of the people that I have had to sit next to on a plane ride, it hasn't been too bad. Um, although there has been a couple of them. I'm the kind of guy that I don't have a problem talking to anybody if I feel the need to. If I don't talk to somebody, it's not because I'm necessarily shy per se. It's just that I don't feel the need to talk to them. But if you ever try to start a conversation with somebody on the plane who does not want to talk to you, they pretend like they didn't hear you. Hi, how you doing? I sometimes find joy just in 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 in. The journey, especially flying, just to, to make people feel uncomfortable. Have you ever sat at, for those of you who fly an airplane, you know how much room they give you in an airplane, right? They don't give you any room. So it is great to do this, and you should try it. If, if, you, know, if you have the right personality, let's say this is, this is the person next to you, and there's a little, I mean, the, the armrest is about this big. It's not big enough for one person much less two people to put their arms on. And so you just do this. And then they're going to, inevitably, what they're going to do is move your arm. It's their arm, right? So what do you do? Just try it. I guarantee you, if they, you, if they were ignoring you, they would stop ignoring you. <laughs> we try to find joy in the journey in whatever case, but the journey is not the destination, and it is not our focus. What is our focus? Our focus is getting there and is having fun. Even, believe it or not, the way home. How many people actually, actually enjoy the travel home? Nobody does. Nobody likes, well, okay, Jack does. We'll pray for him after service. You're looking forward to getting home. You have him slept in your bed, and I don't care what they say, there is no bed out there that is as nice as your bed. You're looking forward to get home for most of us. And then when you get home, you have to take a whole day off just to recover from vacation. There's something wrong with that, that you have to recover from vacation, but you do. It doesn't matter why you're traveling. Most of us spend the majority of our thoughts on our destination. That being the case, why aren't we doing the same thing spiritually? Spiritually. What is our, what is our destination? Well, ho- hopefully everybody in this room is, pretty, is 100% confident that Heaven is your ultimate destination. What we spend here on earth is going to be our journey to our destination, our permanent. That's why Paul says that we are strangers and aliens. We do not belong here. If you have Jesus accepted in your heart, you have a guaranteed place in heaven for all eternity. Compared to all eternity... 
what you're, the amount of time you're spending here is minute. And yet we spend so much of our time making a home here. Now, I'm not saying that you should not, you should not care for yourself or take care of yourself. But compared to the amount of time you think about your permanent home, how much time do you actually spend thinking about this home? That is fleeting, that is passing away, that will not be here forever. When I first bought a motorcycle, I was a, I was in a, col I was a college student, and uh, I bought a motorcycle. The only reason I bought a motorcycle is because it was a really nice motorcycle. It was older, but it was really nice. It's because I bought it for $500, and I didn't have any more than $500. I couldn't buy a car. They had cars that were less than $500, but they were, there was no guarantee they were going to run right. So I bought this motorcycle, and... Uh, <coughs> I, for a long time, I, I wasn't, I didn't let anybody ride because I wanted to get, from, I've never ridden a motorcycle before. I mean, I'd, I'd done four wheelers and things like that. But motorcycle, two wheels, it, it's a different beast. Okay, so I got this motorcycle and my brother was the first one to ride on the back of the motorcycle with me. And here's the words, word for word, that I said to him. Here we go. Hold on tight. And we took off. Guess what he was not doing? Holding on tight. Guess where he was no longer when I took off on the back of my motorcycle? We have a destination. And I think what Paul wants us to know is we are on our way. Here we go. And we need to hold on tight. But hold on tight to certain things, certain things. My brother, um, if he would have held on tight to me, he probably would have been okay. If he would have held on tight to his own shirt, same thing probably would have happened because he's not holding on to the thing that matters. And Paul gives us some ideas about holding on to the things. And he even says that he takes hold of something specific that helps him. And that's what I want to look at today. If we really want to, and it's not that we don't find joy in the journey, but if we really want to enjoy the destination, then we have to focus our attention on the destination. The majority of our thinking should be about our destination. Paul shares some really helpful things in understanding what it takes to be, oh, this is the wrong, do you want me to preach the same message I did last week? I hope not, because uh, this is technology for you. When uh, technology doesn't work. All right, here we go. Philippians chapter 3. We've been going through Philippians. And uh, remember, Paul wrote Philippians as he was in prison. It's considered one of his prison letters. And he didn't really have any specific things that they were dealing with. He wanted to just encourage them. A friend of his had brought him. He was in prison. And so a friend from Philipp Philippi brought him some, some money to help him. And Paul was sending him back. And since he was already going back, Paul says, hey, I'm going to write this letter and send it with him. And so Paul is just kind of encouraging them and helping them be the best that they can be. If you remember the last couple of weeks, I have talked about uh, unity. And uh, um, this, this whole letter is really about unity in different forms and different and how we have humility, or how we have unity is through humility. You are never going to have unity, real unity with somebody, if you always think that you're better than they are.
So keeping that in mind, we read this, Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never, forget, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I, do, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those manip manipulators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus had done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if, if others have reason to, for confidence in their own efforts, <clears throat> I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, a, he, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as far as righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Paul is setting up, um, setting up something. And he is... He wants people to understand that we could, we could say that we have confidence for what the things we do. He talks about confidence in the flesh. It's, we, we seem to think confidence in the flesh is just about physical things, but it's not. Remember, he's dealing with, a, uh, he's dealing with unity, and he's just got done talking. In the previous chapter, he just got done talking about humility and how Jesus was the perfect example. And now he's, he, he's addressing it, the idea of people feeling proud about the things they have done. The confidence in the flesh. Anytime you look at somebody and you think or say anything along these lines, you are suffering from the same thing that Paul is addressing here. Anytime you say something like, well, I'm not as bad as they are. Well, I don't, I don't do that. I have my faults, but they're not as bad as so-and-so's. You know what you're doing? You're instantly putting yourself above. You're insta it's pride that causes those things to be said. The only person, the only person you should ever compare yourself to is Jesus. And when you do, you will realize, just as Paul realized, and we're going to get to this, just as Paul realized, you have no chance. You have no chance. Paul had a reason, if anybody, to be confident in the things that he, is, he had done. He had to write pedigree. He had to write schooling. Pedigree in that he was... He, he was Hebrew. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, means he was educated. And he obeyed the law as good as anybody. And yet we're going to find out what he really views about all of those things. We like to say, well, I'm a good person because of this. I'm a good person because I, I make this amount of money. I'm a good person because I don't go around killing people. I'm a good person because I am honest to my word. When I say something, I do it. But, but is that really what constitutes a good person? Let's flip it around. What constitutes somebody being a bad person? Somebody who tells a lie? Oh, well, if you just tell one lie, then you're not really a bad person. Well, how many lies do you have to tell to become a bad person? Five? Ten? A hundred? 
I would probably, I would probably guess that in my lifetime, I have told probably more than a hundred lies. I'm not bragging about that by any means, and and they were much. I was much younger. What? So because I told a hundred lies, am I an, an evil person now? That's the problem with trying to justify good and bad. Who gets to be the judge? Oh, well, you know what? He doesn't steal from anybody. He just, he just, he just, he works the taxes into his advantage. He just doesn't pay all of his taxes because his government doesn't deserve his money. Listen, if you steal from the government, guess what you are? A thief. Now, am I saying don't take advantage of every tax break you can? No, you do it. I, I honestly believe you give the government as least amount of money as you possibly can. Because they're going to take what they want as much as they can. So you give them as, as little as you can. But you do that under godly principles. I remember when, before, before I met Jeanette, I was the youth pastor, and you know what? Church is not much different when looking for a job than a lot of other places. There are several factors. One is how good your les- resume looks. It's because your resume is really your step. You, 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 it, it opens the door. Two is who you know. A lot of people get good jobs. Their resume is part of that, but a lot of it is who you know. If you know somebody who knows somebody who's hiring and they pay well, then it's who you know. Now, if you're just a poor person and you don't take time management good and you you spend your money wastefully and you don't get to work on time, you won't have that job for very long. But when I was putting my resume together as a youth pastor, I was tempted, I was tempted to overly exaggerate some of my accomplishments. And I think, I think we all do this, maybe not on a resume, but we all kind of do this, okay? We over-exaggerate, you know, I, I, on one of my resumes, I said, we had a youth event, and I had 20 volunteers, and we had 200 kids show up. Now, did 200 kids show up? Well, I think they did, but not all at the same time. I think at any one given time, we only had about 60 kids there. But it sounds better to say we had 200 kids show up. Did I have 20 volunteers? Yeah, but they didn't all show up at the same time, and they didn't all stay for the whole, I had, I had five or six helps uh, set up, I had five or six help tear down, I had five or six during the event, I was creative in the way I did it, and I justified that. Right or wrong, God doesn't need my help to get where he wants me to go. Manipulating a resume, it's you trying to do God's job. And let's be honest, we would be terrible at it. If God wants us to go somewhere, he wants us to do something, he doesn't need us to manipulate situations and circumstances. He needs us to trust him. So, you know, I I, I mentioned last, I think it was last week, Jeanette and I are interested, we are, uh, got a, a contract on the house next to us, that apartment complex. Um, we got a contract, we were excited, um, uh, it was, at that point, I think it was just a verbal contract, but the lady was coming by, and we were going to sign the papers. Jeanette signed, no, it was last Friday, not this past Friday, Friday before that. Jeanette signed the papers um, for the, uh, and we, but we still hadn't definitely got the financing situated yet. Um, we had, I had talked to a couple of mortgage companies, um, and so it was still up in the air. And on Tuesday of this past week, I was, I was 
running through my mind what we can do to get this house. Um, what if the mortgage company decides that um, they don't want to loan us the money? Because let's be honest, if you've seen that house, it needs a lot of work. The roof needs to be replaced, and it, that, that's about thirty dollars to $35,000. I mean, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done in that house. And I was, I was trying to figure out in my mind what we could do, what assets we had that I could liquidate so that we could borrow, we could borrow enough money to get this house if the mortgage company decided they, wanted to do, they, they didn't want to do it. I was driving, my brain, I probably got about four or five gray hairs just from that event right there. Sell my golf cart. That ain't happening. <laughs> my, my wife, I said this yesterday. This is not my sermon, but you'll get a kick out of this. My wife let me get a membership at the golf course because she knew it would be good for me to go out and walk 18 holes when I went golfing. And then I bought a golf cart. Um, So, I completely lost where I was going. <laughs> yeah, gray hair. Yeah, gray hair. Uh, liquidating. Yeah, I got. Yeah. Tuesday morning. It was Tuesday morning. Um, I woke up and I was talking with God and I said, God, you know what? If you don't want us to have this house, I'm willing to give it up. I, I, will, I will just, just, I will stop thinking about it. It's in your hands. If you want us to have it, it'll work out. If you don't want us to have it, so be it. And if, but, but I did tell God this. If I do not buy that house, I am building a four-foot brick wall and a six-foot fence, a wood fence on top of that between my house and that house. Because there's no guarantee of who's going to move in there, whether they're going to fix it up. I just, but I, I got to the point where I said, okay, God, I'm going to stop trying to manipulate things. I'm going to stop doing all of this stuff. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to put it in your hands. That was Tuesday morning. It's probably about, probably about 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock in the morning. I met somebody at 10 o'clock. Um, and was talking with them, and this individual says, Steve, we have some extra cash, and we want to invest this cash. So we, can, we will loan you up to $100,000 to buy this piece of property. Don't you wish you had friends like that? <laughs> uh, and, and he, listen, this person's doing, it's, a, it's an investment for them. They're loaning me. They're not just giving me $100,000. That would be nice, but they're, they're not doing it. They're loaning. It's an investment that we're both, we're both going into. God understands something about us. And that is, when we trust him, when we put things in his hands instead of trying to fix it our own, it works out better for us. And yet we still try and manipulate things. And the problem is, is that we have this skewed sense. This is why putting it in his hands goes so much better for us than keeping it to ourselves. When, when we put it in his hands, he already knows the outcome. When we try and do it ourselves, we have no clue. We have no clue of the outcome. But when we put it in his, he knows what is going to happen to that house in the future. So maybe something bad was going to happen in that house, and he wanted to save me from the, 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 the consequences of what might have happened by not allowing me to have that house. But we don't see that. How do we look at it? Well, pff, God, you're mean. You, you're not looking out for me. If you were looking out for me, you would let me... You would let me have that house. When in actuality, he's saving us. And this is just an illustration of all of the things that how we think. Most of the time, when we don't get our way, 
we think it's because God is punishing us or, or treating us poorly. When in actuality, a lot of times, he's saving us from things. Paul, Paul understood a, a, a lot of things about God that we don't understand. And I think there are two specific reasons for that. One is he had a personal encounter. He had a personal encounter with the risen Savior. Excuse me, the risen Savior. Okay? Now, granted, he was knocked off his horse and, and became blind because of that encounter. But he had that encounter. And I truly think that he, he was able to take on the mind of Christ because of that encounter. Unfortunately, a lot of us, our encounters with Jesus are usually in a setting like this. And they don't profoundly change us. Sure, he moves our, our emotions are moved. And some of the decisions we make are changed. But for the most part, we're the same person we were. I'm not saying God changed Paul's personality. I, I think that is just the opposite. God used that, that ag aggressive personality that Paul had before he was a Christian to promote the gospel after he became a Christian. But it wasn't, it wasn't his personality that was changed. It was his mind that was renewed and changed. And that is why he says, after he talked about his, um, his circumcision on the eighth day, his, his, tr his pure blood citizen of Israel and being from the tribe of Genuine, a Hebrew, a Pharisee, strictest obedience to the laws, zealous for the law. Then he says in verse 7, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. Garbage. Have you ever heard that? Well, I, I, that's a stupid question because I've said it from the pulpit several times. One man's garbage is another man's treasure. Right? We've all heard that, right? Okay. You could get that idea from the word garbage here, but I want to give you a better translation of that Greek word, okay? A better translation of that Greek word is, you ready for it? Poop. In fact, if you read the King James Version, it uses the word dung. Why do I like that description better? Because, just because it's garbage to one person, doesn't mean it's garbage to somebody else. It might be a treasure to somebody else. But let's be honest. Nobody treasures poop. In fact, everybody stays away from it as much as possible. We, uh, we took Eli to the park yesterday over at Priest Park. They had their big Fourth of July thing. And he had never ridden a pony. So we decided that we were going to go and let him ride the pony. And I made the mistake of not letting my wife walk around with him on the pony. Because you know what ponies do, don't you? Horses. They don't care where. If they have to go, guess what they do? They drop poop everywhere. Landmines. Who, nobody wants them. It, they're, they're worse than garbage. At least if you have garbage, you could dig through there, and maybe somebody threw something, a half-eaten pizza away you, that, that might still be good that you can eat. Nobody's going to eat poop. You go to the garbage, you say, oh, man, this would be, if I painted this, I could make it into a candle holder. Nobody's going to use poop as a candle holder. If you do... 
We have a prayer meeting after service. Not only do you, do you not want to have it in your house, you don't want it on the bottom of your feet. What do you do after you step in dog poop? Well, if you're not a Christian, the first thing you do is cuss like a crazy. And then you get mad and you're like, oh. my neighbor right across the street from me has this little sign in the shape of a dog. And it, it, I think it says no, no poop or don't poop or something like that. I want, well, no, I want, I want one in the shape of a human. It says don't poop and put it in my yard. I'm twisted, I know, sometimes. But, but the, but we get this, we, this, this is, he is trying to get you to understand how he felt about his life in trying to do what's good. Because he really felt what he was doing was good. He had the right pedigree. He had the right education. Everything that he had, he considered as poop. But not just that, in comparison. In, in comparison. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. When we grasp the idea that we cannot be righteous, then we have a good per perception, we have a good understanding of humility, and then having a good understanding of humility gives us a good understanding of true unity. But we have to, we have, to have a renewed idea of what, what our life is really about. What our life, is your life about getting up and going to work and making good decisions and telling people about Jesus? If that's all your life is about, you're living for the journey. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things help make the journey joyful. And God even says that he has come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Not that you might eventually have life and have it to the fullest. He wants you to have life right now and have it to the fullest. But that full life doesn't come from thinking about the present. That full life comes from thinking about the future and where we're going to spend eternity. Some of you are, are, still, um, are still lacking on an understanding of eternity, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. Let's assume that this piece of paper right here, this is your life, okay? This is your life, okay? Um, we're going to, I'm trying to figure out. I was trying to figure out which way north was to talk. Okay, this is, this is your life, okay? Everybody understand that, right? I'm going to bring it over here. I'm going to set it up against this wall right here. The cameraman's going crazy because I'm going to set it up right there. It's up against that wall, all right? That's your life, that, that little tiny piece of paper. That is the 70 years, 80 years of your life, okay? Now... Consider that's your life from there all the way to Clorinda. Oh, that, see, I got it wrong anyway. Clorinda, and guess what? You haven't even scratched eternity yet. So why are we spending so much time Worrying about now. We, we should understand that while there is joy in the journey, the destination is our goal. 
the destination is our goal. And we use this journey to get as many people on board as we can. Use this journey to, to, to be a witness to people. You are never, ever going to cons- convince somebody to truly follow God. You will never convince somebody ever to truly follow God. For somebody to truly follow God, God has to work on their heart. I've said this before. If you can convince somebody to follow God, there'll be somebody smarter than you to come and convince them not to follow God. But what, you, what cannot be done is when a God moves on a person's heart, nobody, no outside fluence can cause them to change their heart. They alone can do that. So our obligation isn't just, hey, Jesus loves you. Our obligation is to love them so that God can change them. And in that, we can take as many people to heaven as we want. As many people who will say yes to God. And we have, we, we want to be winners. We want to be victorious. We want, we want people to say, hey, he's, he won, she won. But understand what true, what true victory looks like. Because because we, we 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 just don't we just don't get it most of the time. There's a story um, about a, a kid named Dak, and uh, it's an older story, but it helps us understand really what true victory looks like. And Dak was uh, Dak was diagnosed with spina bifida and was told that he wouldn't, he wouldn't live very long, but even if he did, he would never walk. Well, eventually, Dak decided that he didn't like that prognosis. So he worked hard at trying to walk. And in 1984, at 10 years old, he decided that he was going to enter a marathon, Richmond, Virginia. He started, the gun went off, everybody started running, and everybody got their pace going, and they were running. In fact, I think the winner in that race, if I remember reading correctly, was just under three hours. In three hours... Dak wasn't even a third of the way done. Two crutches. Word got out that um, he was in this race, and, and people, people started gathering around watching him. By the time he got almost to the end, there was about 1,000 people gathered around cheering him on. They had taken the finish line down. They had, uh, most of the runners had already left. And as he was getting closer to the finish line, he had to stop. He had to put his braces down. He had bandages on his arms and gloves. He had to replace the gloves because of holding the, the crutches, just wore away his gloves. He had bandages on his arm to keep the braces that were around there from, and he had to replace all those because they were just wearing out. He gets close to the finish line, and some of the runners, even the, the, even the winner who, who finished in around three hours, something like that, came back. The guys who were putting on the race came back and set up the finish line again. And after 11 hours, In 10 minutes, that crossed the finish line. As I was reading this story, 
I noticed that it was talking about um, it had 856 people started that race. 750-ish finished that race, which, which means 100 people dropped out of that race for various reasons. You get to this one 10-year-old who persevered, probably through more pain and more struggle, definitely longer time than any of the other participants who dropped out. And when he crossed that, that finish line, he wasn't the winner, but he was victorious. Perseverance, not giving up, these are all things that the Bible tells us we need to have to be victorious. Does that mean we're going to be in first place? It doesn't matter. What matters I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling me. Philippians 3.14 Pressing on in this life, through the struggles, through the pain, through the difficulties that it brings, we press on. Why? To be victorious. God says, here we go. Hang on tight. We'll enjoy the journey. There will be a lot of good times. But it's, it, it's about the goal. It's about being victorious in the end. And that's what, that's what Paul wants us to know. That's what God wants us to know. Is that there's a finish line. And the finish line is our goal. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you for being a God that, that gives us more than we deserve. For being a God who holds back the punishment that we deserve. Being a God that gave part of himself just so we could have the opportunity to fellowship with him. Lord, I pray that you would just go with us. Help us keep our destination in sight. Help us live holy lives, pleasing to you. Not to be proud about the things we've done. But because we love you. Help us hold on tight to the faith that we profess. Help us cling to the love that we have. And one day, we'll get to spend eternity with you in heaven. We thank you, we love you, and we ask that you go with us, keep us safe as we continue to celebrate this special holiday. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Hey guys, love you so much. Go with the mercy and grace of God, and we will see you next week.